tonight. With a new Attorney General nominee, concern now falls to Secretary of Defense. Don't let these allegations distract us. What we need is real significant change. The latest on the Trump transition. Plus, is an Israeli ceasefire with Hezbollah imminent? Just uh, yesterday, millions of Israelis ran to bomb shelters. Today, as we're speaking, I'm, I'm sure that uh, people in the north are uh, ready. As the IDF continues its fight against Hamas in Gaza, hope that peace will soon come to the north. And a message from the church to the trans community. You are wonderfully made. How a ministry is helping children and their parents struggling with identity. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. A major legal victory for President-elect Trump tonight as he makes his final cabinet selections. Good evening in Washington, I'm Jenna Browder. Special counsel Jack Smith has moved to dismiss two federal cases against Trump, his January 6th election interference case and the classified documents case. The legal victory comes as Trump moves full steam ahead with his transition back to the White House. With most of his top cabinet picks in place, the focus now turns to the potential worldwide impact of the upcoming administration. Senators on both, uh, from both parties, though, are signaling an uphill battle remains for at least two of his nominees. A CBN Capitol Hill correspondent Michelle London has the latest on the Trump transition tonight. Michelle? Jenna, Republican Senator James Langford and Democrat Senator Tammy Duckworth have questions about Pete Hexeth and Tulsi Gabbard following new revelations from their past. Meanwhile, Trump's incoming national security advisor, Mike Waltz, wants to get ahead of escalations in the Middle East. We've met uh, for our adversaries out there that think this is a, a time of opportunity, that they can play one administration off the other. Uh, they're wrong. Uh, and, uh, and we are we are hand in glove. We are we are one team. Representative Walt says he and President Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, are on the same page concerning U.S. policy and options in Ukraine. Waltz telling Fox News Sunday they're working together to bring both sides to the table while emphasizing Trump's desire for the conflict to end quickly. We need to bring this to a responsible end. We need to restore deterrence, res restore peace, and get ahead of this escalation ladder rather than responding to it. He also praised Israel and Prime Minister Netanyahu for recent military operations, saying Iran is incredibly exposed. Still on Capitol Hill, support for key Trump cabinet choices like Tulsi Gabbard, his pick for director of national intelligence, is questionable. So I do think that we have a real deep concern whether or not uh, she's a compromised uh, person. Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth citing Gabbard's trip to Syria back in 2017, which the former Democrat described as a fact-finding mission. Oklahoma Senator Mark Wayne Mullen rushed to Gabbard's defense. If she was compromised, if she wasn't able to, uh, to pass a background check, if she wasn't able to do her job, she still wouldn't be in the Army. Trump's pick for Defense Secretary Pete Hexeth faces continued scrutiny after a police report revealed a woman accused him of sexual assault back in 2017, although he denies those allegations and charges were dropped. Republican Senator Joni Ernst told Politico the claims are worthy of a discussion. Others say they'll focus on his talent. Don't let these allegations distract us. What we need is real significant change. And Trump's team also decided to forego FBI background checks for cabinet nominees, which bypasses a traditional step. The president-elect also wants Dr. Marty McCary to lead the FDA. McCary, a surgeon and author, opposed vaccine mandates during the pandemic. Jenna. All right, Michelle, thank you. And CB News senior White House correspondent Kelly Wright joins us now from the White House. Kelly, let's start with us. Special, special counsel Jack Smith moving to dismiss those two federal cases. What does this mean for the incoming Trump administration and what's next? It's a big deal for the incoming president and his administration who will be able to go into his inauguration day free of any legal woes. Here's what Stephen Chung, the Trump communications director, stated today on the heels of this news. He says the American people reelected President Trump with an overwhelming mandate to make America great again. Today's decision by the DOJ ends the unconstitutional federal cases against President Trump and is a major victory for the rule of law. The American people and President Trump want an immediate end to the political weaponization of our justice system. 
and we look forward to uniting our country. Jenna? What does this mean for January 6th, the attack, and, and how Americans view it nearly four years later? So let's take you back to the January 6th committee that met here on Capitol Hill as they talked about what unfolded on that day. Representative Zoe Lofgren speaking today on a published report stating that she, as a former committee member, she's disappointed in this move that Jack Smith has made. However, you have Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas, a Republican who is a staunch supporter of President-elect uh, Donald Trump stating the Jack Smith cases will be remembered as a dark chapter of weaponization. They never should have been brought. Our elections are decided by voters, not by fanatical, deranged liberal lawyers like Jack Smith. Jenna. Yeah, Kelly, what does this mean for some of the other um, you know, nominations for Trump, especially Pam Bondi, who's up for attorney general? That's a very good question. Pam Bondi, of course, has been a strong supporter of the president-elect. She has stood by his side. She has appeared on television in the past, on Fox News, and she stated there that this is a situation where prosecutors have to be prosecuted and investigators have to be investigated in order to remove the DOJ from the deep, the deep state. So it remains to be seen how she will handle this if she is able to sail through those confirmation hearings to become President Trump attorney general but remember she's the attorney for all americans people so let's see what happens in the future yeah all right january uh, we'll be here before we know it uh, kelly thank you kelly wright as a senior white house correspondent at the white house tonight thank you kelly in the middle east israel is close to reaching a ceasefire with hezbollah israel's security cabinet is expected to green light the deal tomorrow the draft proposal includes a 60-day period during which Israeli forces would withdraw from southern Lebanon and Hezbollah would remove its heavy weapons north of a key river. We believe uh, that the trajectory of this is going in a very positive direction. Uh, but, again, yeah, nothing is done until everything is done. Nothing's all negotiated until everything is negotiated. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is already facing pushback from critics who believe more should be done to destroy Hezbollah. It comes as the terror group continues to fire rocket barrages at Israeli cities while the IDF carries out heavy strikes on Beirut. The two sides have exchanged fire nearly every day since Hamas's October 7th massacre. More than 3,500 Lebanese and 140 Israelis have been killed. Meanwhile, in Europe, a key Trump ally is throwing cold water on the idea of negotiating a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine. Speaking at the Halifax International Security Forum over the weekend, Senator Mike Round said the Kremlin cannot be trusted and will view a peace deal as a sign of Western weakness. I fear, as much as I would love to say that there is a path towards a peaceful resolution to this by negotiating with this tyrant, I suspect that we may be deceiving ourselves. Round stressed that his views were not the position of the incoming Trump administration. Trump has vowed to broker a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine soon after retaking the White House. The Middle East and Ukraine will be top of the agenda at this week's G7 meeting. It comes as world leaders face mounting pressure to advance diplomatic efforts before Trump returns to the White House. Foreign ministers from several nations are in Italy to discuss ways to support a ceasefire in Gaza and Lebanon. The leaders will also tackle escalating tensions between Russia and Ukraine. The G7 has been on the forefront of providing military and economic support to the war-torn nation. David Daoud joins us now. He is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. David, welcome. So we know Lebanon is top of mind at this G7 meeting. What do you make of the proposed ceasefire deal? Do you think it's, it's viable? Uh, thank you for having me on. Well, it depends on what you mean by viable. Can it be reached? Can it be agreed to? There's always a possibility. Is it a good deal? I don't think so. I think that the deal contains many gaps that repeat uh, the underlying mistakes that led to Resolution 1701's failure, namely uh, an over-dependence upon Lebanon and Lebanese actors um, to restrain Hezbollah to uh, fulfill their obligations under international law when Lebanon has demonstrated that, that it lacks both the ability and the will um, to enforce its sovereignty and to restrain Hezbollah. Uh, David, you know, we're talking about a ceasefire between Israel and Hezbollah, but could that potentially set the stage for a ceasefire in Gaza down the road? 
Uh, there is a possibility. I mean, Israeli military operations are continuing in the Gaza Strip. Uh, Hezbollah has uh, stance from the outset of this conflict has been that it will continue attacking Israel until a prior ceasefire is achieved in Gaza. Um, who knows if this deal is going to be used uh, as a pressure point or leverage on the Israelis to also simultaneously stop the war in Gaza, give Hezbollah an off-ramp. Uh, there were reports uh, by uh, Israeli journalists that um, part of what led Prime Minister Netanyahu to agree to the ceasefire deal in Lebanon was that the Biden administration finally agreed to uh, lift the embargo on certain weapons uh, that had not been transferred to Israel. So perhaps the Biden administration has more pressure points on the Israelis to wrap this whole thing up and not just in Lebanon. Uh, let's talk about Ukraine while I have you here. Um, you know, the war there has really escalated in recent days. Uh, what can world leaders do, David, to keep this from spiraling even more? Oh, that's a little out of my wheelhouse. I don't really deal with Ukraine, but um, I think, you know, the incoming Trump administration seems to have the uh, the confidence of Ukrainian leader uh, Vladimir Zelensky, uh, perhaps a more forward American posture, bringing both sides to the table. But again, like I said, this is not something that I, I normally deal with. Um, you know, I, I know it's not your, your, your wheelhouse, these mm. countries particularly, but just the idea that um, doing this deal might make the, the West and America look weak on the world stage. Do you think there's merit to that? Uh, the, the, the Lebanon deal, you're saying? Uh, the deal, the, the possible deal between Ukraine and Russia mm -hmm. and, and Vladimir um, look, Putin thinking mm -hmm. that this makes the West look weak. Mm -hmm. Look, I think uh, uh, Vladimir Putin had an objective uh, with, with invading Ukraine. It wasn't just limited to, to territorial expansionism. I think he wanted to uh, shatter the international rules-based order, which is founded upon American power and which which helps project American power. Um, if you accept uh, the outcomes of a war of aggression in Ukraine, uh, then perhaps you're also contributing to the to the erosion of that international order and setting, you know, setting setting the West back and telling dictators or actors uh, like uh, Vladimir Putin that they can continue to act with impunity. And these rules uh, don't really matter. All right, David, thanks for going a little bit outside of your wheelhouse uh, this evening. We always appreciate having you on. David Dowd with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Coming up, politics at the Thanksgiving table. How to navigate difficult conversations with your family this holiday. Welcome back. Thanksgiving is traditionally a time for family celebration, but anymore, as many of you probably know, politics can easily get in the way. After another divisive election season, many gatherings will try to keep that subject off of the table this year. A senior Washington correspondent Tara Merchner is here now with more on how you can navigate this delicate topic. Tara? Oh, Jenna, and delicate it is. Many families are setting ground rules and even creating politics-free zones for a focus on keeping the peace. Thanksgiving, a time for turkey, football, He's got it. Touchdown. and family hanging out with our kids and teaching them how to be thankful and not finding ways to argue. Get them out. And this holiday, after one of the country's more contentious elections, many families are seeking to ensure a peaceful gathering by leaving political debates behind. Because people are very polarized about um, what they think is going to happen and people wishing terrible things upon other people based on how they voted. This approach is also part of a growing trend. In 2023, 60% of Americans said they avoided political discussions at holiday gatherings. This year, that number is expected to be even higher. Paul says it's okay to have an opinion that you don't share. that that's okay. It's okay to have an opinion that you don't share on social media. It's okay to have an opinion that you don't share around the table at Thanksgiving. Not everyone, however, might be willing to steer clear. Try summarizing what they've said to make sure that you understand and to show them that you understand. Other practical tips for keeping the peace include setting ground rules in advance, focusing on shared values and positive topics, using humor to diffuse tension. And for those who can't resist the temptation to debate. Sometimes it's best to approach the conversation like a reporter, 
like somebody who's just curious to learn, to think, where did you, where did you get that information from? Is there anything I could say that would help you see this issue differently? All right, so whether politics makes the cut or not, the Thanksgiving table remains a symbol of togetherness, something we can all be thankful for. And for those still worried about potential clashes, another piece of advice is to have a word or a phrase ready to signal the need for, well, a timeout. Maybe Jenna like, cut the pie or stuff the bird. Or pass the gravy. <laughs> all right, Tara, thank you. Up next, a powerful message from the church to the trans community. How one church is helping bridge the gap. President-elect Trump is expected to sign an executive order that would remove transgender Americans from the military. According to the report from The Times, the move could happen as early as his first day in office on January 20th. There are believed to be about 15,000 active service members who identify as trans. They would be medically discharged and determined unfit to serve. The order would also lead to a ban on trans people joining the military. Well, churches are now starting to address the transgender crisis. I spoke to one pastor in Northern Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C., who's teaching on the topic and forming a support group for parents. My question is, how do you plan on addressing the transgender issue in women's sports? It's an issue almost no one really discussed five years ago. Redefined the term women. But today is impossible to ignore. LGBTQ issues have become a major issue this election cycle, particularly transgender rights. The transgender crisis affecting an estimated 1.6 million Americans. The issue now so common, pastors are weighing in. Culture doesn't set the tone for truth here, that the Word of God sets the tone. Marty Baker is the senior pastor at Burke Community Church in Northern Virginia. As gender ide ideology like began to surface in 2017, 2018, uh, began to be uh, infiltrated into the school systems, taught to children, that type of thing, well, by definition, you started having parents wondering, what is this? He chose to focus on the issue in his doctoral dissertation and consistently teaches on it from the pulpit. We've taught them a lot about the information of it, or um, the apologetics of it, how to defend, how to push, push truth as opposed to error, those types of things. Uh, so they're very educated on that. Uh, but what do you do with all the, the life stories? And there's lots of those. The life stories. Pastor Baker says those life stories came up during a church women's retreat. More than 100 women had questions and needed wisdom. And I think a lot of churches five years ago weren't talking about this, but it's the last five years has seen such an acceleration. I think it's time for churches to be teaching more on the topic. Ed Stetzer is the dean at Biola University's Talbot School of Theology. He says Christians need to speak on this issue in a biblical way that's filled with grace. He sees a big opportunity for the church here. So I think this is an opportunity for the Church of Jesus Christ to actually put forth a beautiful, image of sexuality and gender that actually I think will call to people who are living in a confused and, 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 and we're all in a broken world, but just unsure about those things. Well, let's say here the Bible gives us a path. We want to walk with you on that path. Church member Dr. Susan Ashton Lazaro deals directly with teens on this path as a pediatrician. I will say that thankfully the number of children presenting with gender dysphoria has decreased in the past couple of years, which is truly encouraging. On a recent plane trip, Dr. Ashton Lazro says she saw God's hand at work when she happened to sit next to the head of the Christian Post and the issue of transgenderism came up. Once we started talking about that, um, the CEO, Christopher Chu, he said, oh, we're trying to have an event in Northern Virginia, but we can't find a church that's brave enough to host this event for us. And that's when we started chatting about the fact that I thought our pastor, Pastor Marty, um, would most likely be interested in hosting an event in conjunction with Christian Post. And it happened. Dr. Ashton Lazaro and other experts in the field gathered at Burke Community Church in October for a conference. During the event, leaders announced the formation of a new support group, Wonderfully Made, a ministry for parents with children who identify as trans and refuse to bow to the pressure of society to socially and surgically transition them. The group is for parents whose children are struggling with their identity. And our aim is to walk in prayer and support and grace with these families to help them 
feel that they're not alone. In Psalm 139, verse 14, talks about God makes you individually. So if God made you, then by definition, he didn't make a mistake. And so there's purposes in how he designs us. That's the essence of the whole thing. God made us, you know, male and female. Genesis 1 says so. Uh, so he didn't make a mistake. Um, so how do you handle a system that's telling you it is a mistake? The group has no pastoral leadership or curriculum. It's simply parents leaning on parents. It's caring for each other. And, uh, and that's getting down and into the mess of other people's lives, uh, crying with them, uh, being concerned about them, because a lot of these people feel alone. And Wonderfully Made had its first meeting at the beginning of this month. The church tells us 12 people showed up, a mix of people wanting to help launch the group and others needing support. All right, still ahead, a traditional presidential pardon. That's next on Faith Nation. Download the CBN News app, 24-7 News, from a Christian perspective at home or on the road. One place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts. Set daily prayer goals and pray for news stories. Read the most important news and watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Go to CBNNewsApp.com to get the app today. Finally tonight, a Thanksgiving tradition at the White House. Two lucky turkeys were pardoned by President Biden today in a ceremony on the South Lawn. Celebrating the 77th annual National Thanksgiving Turkey Presentation, this year's turkeys are Peach and Blossom, named after the Delaware State Flower, which symbolizes resilience, President Biden's state. Leading up to their moment in the spotlight, the turkey stayed in a luxurious suite at the Willard Intercontinental Hotel near the White House. Both turkeys will head to a farm in Minnesota to live out the rest of their days, far from anyone's Thanksgiving table. And that's going to do it for Faith Nation this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow and have a great night.